The Venus Project Team Speak Seminar, August 19, 2012. All right, so this is on Frescoian ideas about approval and being adjusted, and well, you make your own decision what it's about. One of the major myths is that you can talk things out. Once you learn that that's not possible, then you're light years ahead. If you sit down with a lot of people that have had major difficulties that try to talk things out, uh, you'll find that it usually doesn't work. Yeah. The reason it doesn't work is because what they talk about is a position of differential advantage. If you're in that position, sitting on a mountaintop where it's nice and cool, and it's the only mountaintop in town, and Joe calls on you one day and says, look, the, the nights are very hot. We would like to spend some time up there. And you say, well, maybe someday you will. But you're not about to get off. You know what I mean? Well, do you? Yeah, I understand. You're saying that certain the kids have a differential advantage, the other kid fights. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. One kid is in a position of advantage for the time being. Also, uh, I have seen people walk over and say, my God, look at that couple. They have 125 rooms in that house, and other people are seven people in the same room. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. I mean, what do they expect within the price system? They expect the guy to turn over his house and convert it to an orphanage? You know, what do they expect? Do you see what I mean? I Suppose you had words, ten television commercials a day that you were doing, nationally, and some actor came over and said, my God, he said, I haven't had a commercial in six months. You're going to pat him on the back and say, why don't you do some of mine? I'm, I'm overloaded. Would you? I wonder why they don't do that, but they don't. That's you know true. damn well why they don't do it. Because you can't have a Mercedes <laughs> and a cabin cruiser and two kids in college and a world cruise planned next year <laughs> with that attitude. Right? Okay. That's why they don't do it. Because they will do good so long as that good, so to speak, doesn't distract from from their particular mode of living. You know, you can get conditioned to a very high standard of living. Where are you going next year? I think you don't even think of that. You wonder how you're going to eat next year. You don't think, my God, next year I'm going to South Africa, and I'm going to cross over the poles. I've never been there, and I land in green. I don't ever hear you talk like that. I, I never hear you plan ways of spending thousands of dollars. When you come here, you never talk that way. And I know why. Even that you're not interested. <laughs> you, you look through your files to see how you stand, and the conversation's dead, right? Okay. And I just said, I think I mentioned this at other sessions, that most people never live the way they want to. They live the way they have to. Is that right? Okay. Now, there are some people who, who want to get next to very successful people, as close as they can, hoping it'll rub off. You understand what I mean? You know, I've never met a, a sweet old lady or a nice old guy that said, I used to live next door to Einstein, I taught him many things. No, they just says, I live next door to Einstein, that's all. You do, okay? Even if you fixed Einstein's toilet amongst the plumbers, it's a big thing. So, you got to remember where people are at. Okay. Now, people are at a place by habit. Their habits of thought keep them where they're at. And they come here once in a while, and they hear certain ideas, and then they go outside, and the world works the other way. And they wonder why this system doesn't work for them. Because this system doesn't work except for yourself. It doesn't work on other people. This system is essentially learning how to step over quicksand. As you walk through a slimy area, you know the pattern of mud. You know what I mean? And you step over it. And when the guy says, how come you step over the mud? Everybody steps in it. You say, because I'm an odd boy. <laughs> now, what do you want? That's the old question. What do you want? Well, a person says to me, well, I want to, I want, all I want is getting along in the world. I just don't want to carry the problems I'm carrying. Then, uh, it's a man of the stock market that keeps saying, I hope the stocks don't go down. And if you don't invest in it, if you've got enough money, live on there. And if you, if you have any surplus funds, and you put them in the stock market, and it goes down, you just kiss it goodbye. People are not conditioned to that. People are conditioned to words like success, amounting to something. I hear this all the time. I'm, you know, 43 years old, and I'm still nowhere. 
That would mean that if you ask them what somewhere, where somewhere was, what is somewhere? They don't know that either. That's why they can't go anywhere. It's the story of a guy in a dark woods with a lamp that doesn't work. Okay? And he says, I've got to find my way out. And you say, what is out? He says, I wish I knew. And you can guarantee that guy will go around in the woods continuously. Now here's another story. Paul always wanted to be able to draw bears, but he can't get a photograph of Ben. He doesn't know where to get it. He doesn't know how to use charcoal or drawing paper. And so what he has is a verbal habit that goes nowhere. Uh, there are many people in the world today that are verbally equipped to hurt themselves because they repeat themselves. Whenever you hear that kind of repetition that runs like this, well, God damn it, I had a slip, rather than the living circumstances were so fucking unbearable and boring, I wanted to close them off, and I couldn't. And when I took to drinking, it closed them off for the time being. I always said that if a man didn't drink when he had a problem, he'd lose his mental equilibrium. I would imagine that as long as people have a place they can go, whether it's the Bean Shooter Club or some place to go, and the guy says, did you hit the target? They know what I'm going to try. As long as you've got something to do, I don't care for the Bean Shooter Club, because it doesn't really amount to anything. And like I said before, sobriety without direction doesn't amount to anything. If somebody comes up and says, well, I haven't had a drink now in 12, 15 years. I say, well, what do you do with your life? Nothing. Nothing to take. It doesn't matter. But if your life has become richer and fuller, you just don't have time to dull it out. You don't want to dull out anything that's interesting. You don't want to turn it off. Uh, and, and in some instances, you go to a movie that you don't like, and when it gets boring, you walk out. But when you're in life with nine kids and a wife on your back and in-laws on your back, their claws suck into your skin, you don't just step out without all those claws connected to you. Yeah? But when you drink, you don't feel the claws. They all hang on, and they tell you to stop drinking, and if they don't let go. If they let go, they said, look, do what you have to do. And you did it, and they didn't bore you out for it. There are very few people that are free, and the, the free people are disliked. You meet a person that's free, and they're disliked by everybody. You know why? Because you're getting away with a lot. You, you know what I know about? A successful person is not really admired, they're disliked. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people feel very secure when they're around people that said, uh, Jesus Christ, I got uh, virus, and I got a, an appendicitis infection, and I've got some dental work, and the guy says, you got nothing, nothing. And he goes on, and he lays out, he opens the thing, and there's no leg there. <laughs> no, they go through this matching chip. And that's what it is, uh, uh, Psychotics Anonymous. They'll tell you about the trouble they had with other people. And he said, well, let me tell you about the trouble I had with people. And so they tell each other about the troubles they had. And it's better than sitting home looking out the window. That I guarantee you. If I had a problem like that, I would go to Neurotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd go somewhere where something was happening. It's better than sitting home looking at my face in the mirror saying, You again! <laughs> With your same old shit. And, and that's where most people are at. They get tired of themselves. And, but they hope that other people won't. <laughs> that's the big myth that other people don't know you as well as you know you so you go out there and you do this and say do it again you do it again these people accept you now you feel comfortable but it's not real acceptance it's that they're so fucking bored that this amuses them well you come in three days in a row and do that to see how far you get they'll go right off in the corner and kick down but if you do this then they'll turn around for a minute and they'll go away again because the idea is that most people that seek a solution to their lives through the company of other people are not going to find a solution to their lives. That's the answer. Now, what is a solution to a person's life? Well, when I use the term solution, I mean something that would ease the state of affairs. And it runs always the same pattern. To become interested in things other than yourself. That's a tough assignment. Now, somebody wants to find out where the Nile began. Some years ago, somebody got everything, he's got a nice house and a nice car, but God damn it, where does the Nile begin? 
Everybody has a predator. So he goes through jungles of mosquitoes and malaria and running eyes, but goddamn, he's going to find the source of the Nile. And he gets letters from some obscure scientist living in an ivy-colored brick building in England saying, have you had, have you been fortunate in your findings? You know, these guys go on for years. And somebody wants to know whether or not the rhesus isle monkeys are kinder to their offspring than the monkeys found in Borneo. So what? But as long as they're busy, that's the answer. They're busy as shit. Now, there are kids that will pick up leaves as they fall off the trees. You know, but if the leaves fall off all trees, they stop picking them up. This is too many leaves. But there are leaves that fall occasionally, and then people will collect them and seal them in glass. And they got lots of leaves. As long as you're busy, whether you tear stamps off or not, boom them up. And the guy comes into your room and he says, Dad, what is it? That's from Port of France, one of the first stamps ever printed. You can tell by the L being inverted. And the guy says, no. Yeah. And he gives him a lens and he looks at it. And as long as you're busy, I don't give a shit whether you're looking up assholes. Busy. Painting pictures, drawing, making things. And when you walk over to a mirror and say, I've been married three times and I don't amount to a shit. I had three kids and they don't even pick up the phone. He says, Dad, how are you? If you start on that shit, then you become smaller and smaller and more worthless. And the idea is to get busy. I don't give a shit whether you collect stamps or not, as long as you're busy. It would be better if you collected things that made sense, which very few people do. You know, if you collect a set of values that work for you. Or you collect a set of values, which is a good technique, you collect values and try them out. They don't work, drop them. Pick up a new set of values. Then Roxanne says, Fresco, how come? Last week you had these right, now you got these. Can't you make up your mind? It's Roxanne that has the problem. I am sick of myself. Well, you mean this is not good? She says, yes. So I throw away and I got nothing. And I keep walking around and, and I grab something. Here it is. How about that, Roxanne? Well, now I got nothing. This is the problem. Not to depend on what Roxanne proves up. She doesn't do these things. But the idea is to be able to find a system that you enjoy. And you share it with other people. You hold it up and they go like that, and well, you put it down. And if you can't get to them, whatever, then you let go. There are some people that can't get to other people. Stand up a minute, Carl. I talk to Carl, he's always looking elsewhere, and I'm going like that all the time. You ever see people like that? Listen to me. See? And I says, I've tied a knot at the leading edge of every hair on my head. He says, good. And that's all he got to say. I can't, can't get enough out of that. There are people that require the approval of others, and this is how you get sick. When you're looking for somebody to walk over and say, that was terrific. If they ever do that, you got to remember, people that do that also do this. Oh, did you fuck up last Wednesday? The same person. So the idea is if you seek approval, there's condemnation at the other end of the barrel. I mean, with interest. And the idea is to find things you like to do. Read your manuscripts, rewrite Arrowsmith, try to get people together and redo the play and change it, select your characters, write, get busy. But when you finish and you sit down with the enthusiasm you have for something you believe in, you can sometimes persuade other people to engage in that direction. Sometimes you can. And when you can't, the uh, cumulative record that you made of all the things that you have found out, that you hold up, and people say, frankly, I don't give a shit. Well, sometimes people go home and they tear up this thing. Once you tear up this thing, it is symbolic that you could never do anything and ever feel it was good unless Van stamped okay on it. And I'm trying to tell you to say, Write because you like to write. Submit it because you want a reaction, not approval. And Van says, the midsection of its change will be great. And this portion here, change that and it'll be good. Then you show it to Joe, and he says, Jesus Christ, you got nothing in the middle and nothing here. These are different reactions. You can't do a hit movie. This is nonsense. You can do a movie that a lot of people like and other people despise. 
Does that make sense? Okay. The idea then is to find things you like to do. Otherwise you never make it. Now the last and final thing, the collapse of a personality, is when you wind up in a mental institution. That's collapse. Now there's only one guy that will really listen to you. And that's a psychiatrist. I mean, he really doesn't listen. I mean, he, he, he couldn't he get sick if he listened to you. You may think he's listening to you. You may sit down and say, let me tell you what happened the other day. Oh, well, fucking, I brought a new car and a guy back in with He don't give a shit. At all, really. And uh, he says, yes. And you go on and you tell him all, as long as you're talking about it, you feel much better. But you're not being helped. When you're being helped, here's how you tell when you're being helped. Whenever you come to a person depressed and they talk to you and you grab their hands and say, oh, that was, I needed that. That was real good. Then when you walk out, you look at the world with the same pair of values, the same set of eyes. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you're driving through the code section of town in Blackville when there's trouble. And they throw a whiskey bottle at your car, your brand new paint job. You understand? Know and the whole idea then is uh, is to accept that. Watch the flames. That that attitude. Watch the paint burn off. It's interesting. And if you get any on you, try to wipe it off. But not. You don't do this. You don't say, Jesus Christ, if I didn't drive through that part of town, I'd have had a good paint job on my car. That's piece other than that's something else. If it didn't rain, we'd live in the desert. You know what I mean? And the people that review nothing things. You know what that means? They review nothingness all day long. And so, if you get into significance, I warned you about this before, if you find a useful way of thinking, you won't have too many friends. Now, what do you want? What do you want? Do you want approval? Or do you want to find a system that works for you? Okay. There are some people that have been forced to spend time alone as kids. I don't know whether they did clay modeling or drawing or wood carving, but the more that you spend time alone, you learn to live with yourself. Now, if you had an experience up to about eight years old of being a loner, a loner that was occupied, then when you go out in the world and it's kind of chilly out there and nasty and less acceptable, you can always go into that dark room. You know what I mean? Develop photos. You can always go back to that. But if you were the kind of a child where you came into the room and, you know, did some kind of dance and the parents all bent down and said, now, isn't that wonderful? And they brought Uncle Harry and the Aunt Minnie and everybody went through the jig. Now, when you're seven years old, you know, look at that. It's not now. <laughs> not now. It doesn't work anymore. And so you keep going different places and doing all kinds of things that get that reaction and you can't. So you die inside because you depend on approval. Now, if you get up and announce in a group, you, if, if I came into a group and I said, this is the greatest fuck-up that ever lived, there's nothing they could say. <laughs> <laughs> You've wiped out the total system of comment. The biggest fuck-up that ever lived. Now, what the hell is a person going to say? I've never kept a steady job. I never wanted to. <laughs> On down the line, that's a well-adjusted person. But the person that, oh, that has problems comes into the room like this. He says, the reason I can't get a job is because of my sister. That's why. Nag, 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 nag. <laughs> Don't you laugh, but you did it too. There are people that always got a big bunch of shit they carry around a file of the reasons for their failure. But if a guy says, why did you fail? Because I'm in no good shape. <laughs> it's that simple. And the guy says, my God, how can you live with myself, with your stomach? You say, I couldn't until I realized it. <laughs> Is that all right? No. I remember sleeping in a bed with one spring that was loose, and I, I didn't have any equipment to deal with that problem. So I learned to sleep around the, the loose spring. Kind of an odd position. You know? And uh, that was the best I could do at the time. Well, maybe I took a portion of an egg crate and stuck it over the spring area and something, and I slept and I had an odd pattern in my back. But I accepted that because I, I entered into the agreement of sleeping on the bed with a lousy spring. Now, the, the bit is essentially this. 
you have learned, most people have learned to do that in areas. And I find everybody to be magnificently well-adjusted in particular areas. And that the, the well-adjusted person in particular areas runs like this. The ability that we have to accommodate to awkward terrain. We come, before we get to the hill, before we get there, we look at it. And we see the angle of it, and we lean in accordance with the angle of incline. And we start walking up the hill. It's good. Then we get to the top, there's an angle of decline. And we learn how to walk like that, down the angle of decline. Then when we get to the bottom of the hill, we find the sidewalk is tilted, and we learn how to walk like that. We adjust to the angles of inclination. If Carl turns a high studio light on up that, you go like that. And if it gets righty, you go like that. That's called accommodation. Within certain ranges, we accommodate. But if he turns it on, you know, 10 million candle power, that we don't have the range to accommodate to that. We die if we don't get out. Okay. All of us always accommodate. We look at a place and we see that we can't get our car in. That's too, too narrow if we have that kind of judgment. An excellent accommodation is to leave that parking lot. We do it all the time. We go to a mechanic and or we go any place. And here's, here's a particular thing. Here's a boat you have and here's the dock, the only available dock. You go by, you slow up, and you leave. That's accommodation. That's not running away. Because when he comes home and I'm his wife, I say, oh, you know what time it is? Uh-uh. <laughs> and and he's got, he comes into that fucking prison. That's a trap. Look at your shoes, full of mud. Clean the carpet and all that sort of thing. Now, there are very, I've never met anybody that designed a house with a bowl-shaped bottom and a drain here and a chain that you pull and flush everything in the house down the drain. I mean, if it's that important for you to keep a clean floor. You understand? Now, there are many swimming pools here. They said, don't, don't forget to take a shower. Probably tell you before you enter the pool. Well, that's all nice, but with the pigs that I had, they couldn't get to the pool unless they went through nine showers. There's no way to get there. Now, what do you want? The whole idea of trying to legislate sanity and legislate behavior is a big job. But the idea of, this is what environmental rig means. You rig the environment, so this guy over here doesn't say, did you take a shower before you entered the pool? You'd never know how he got to this point, because it's all enclosed. He couldn't get to that point without going through nine showers. Does that make sense? All right. Now, if you walk into one of our restaurants, you get weighed on the way in. Not laid, weighed <laughs> on the way in. And then on the way out, if you step on a scale, it says nine bucks for the dinner. You know what I mean? On your way out. You, you pay according to the calories you take in. Now, if you read the system like that, people would say it's too mechanical. But if you turn them loose on their own, on their own, without law, if you had a land without law, any kind of law, you would have a law. Another law. You know what law it is? They have slang for it. Law of the jungle. They have another one. Things are always lawful. No one ever violates the law. A big fat guy walks lawful. That's lawful for his weight. And you say you're big fat clumsy clout? You're not. You're not. You've got something wrong with you. He's all right. But if a guy becomes that fat, or a gal, like 600 pounds, the well-adjusted 600 pounder looks at a chair, as you do, he says, I wonder if the legs are going to support me. And he sits there, and he starts bending. And he gets off, and he laughs. That's a well-adjusted person. But the, the person that's sick doesn't sit there. He doesn't try. He says, it's glands. You know, it may be glands, whatever the hell it is. Apologizing for your lifestyle is, is an illness. Another interesting thing is to go to a place where there's a lot of people and dress very well, expensively, if you can. The guy says, what does that suit cost? It's 700 bucks. What do you do? Nothing in particular. He must be rich. I am. In fact, if you're just sitting home in front of the pool, fanning yourself with a cigar, the guy says, what do you do for a living? You see that hotel over there? You mean the party room? That's right. Like, you're in your second. They'll make assumptions. He must own it or have shares in it. They're the ones that have nothing to do. There are a lot of people with nothing to do. And they sit around at resorts and they want something to do. 
So they say, oh, you're new at this resort. The boss says, yeah. What do you do? Nothing in particular. You want to play golf? Never play golf. A game of cards? You want to go for a walk? No, not particularly. There's a swimming meet in the afternoon. Enjoy yourself. Not particularly. They won't go to call very much. You understand that? Because call is not fulfilling to their needs. People are not interested in you. That's a hard thing to learn. People really don't give a shit about you. Uh, and, and you can walk out and say, I don't like what he says at all. That's terrible. People only give a shit about extensionality. You know what that means now? Do you know what that means, extensionality? When you walk over and say, geez, I've got to tell them, they say, by the way, if you wear this type of shoe, you won't have that type of pain. Then you're interested. Because the person is useful to you. Everything they say makes sense, you can use it. But if a person comes over and says, you got hair on your arm. <laughs> so lost. One pocket is darker than the other. So lost. And there's a lot of people that are one pocket, the pocket is darker than the other all day long. And the next day they say, I see you're still wearing the same shirt with a dark pocket. And we think that we must engage in conversation. We must. And so we get sick. We get sick. And, and your relatives say, why don't you go out and mix with people? These are monkeys out there. You don't go out and mix with people and your life doesn't improve. Except the first day. Everybody shake your hand. The third day, they got an opinion about you. So, the relatives are smart in the sense that they get you out of their fucking environment. Why don't you go out and meet people? Then when the door closes, oh, the idea is they get you out of there. And if you're there and you remain, it means you need to prove it. It's that simple. Now, if you want to make your life very complicated, you can go to the library and get a book of what's wrong with me. That's on the cover. <laughs> and everybody believes there's something wrong with it. But you'll notice that when they take that book out of the library, they conceal it on the way out. <laughs> because very few people, like other people, know that they're reading, you know, what to do about sympathy. <laughs> Big fat <problem. laughs> And when they take the book home, they may worry. Because they put it under the drawer, you know, not in the drawer. And because they worry about those things. There are very few guys that can go to bed with a girl and fly in bed, and they can't get it up. The thing goes down all the time. You say, well, I can't get it up. Instead of saying, well, Saturday morning I had to move a milk truck and all that. No. Big fucking story. There are days when people don't get it up. There are people days when they can't keep it down. It but don't worry about it. Sitting home, getting the handbook, relax first. It's the first relax, smoke cigar, have a glass of wine. And they have a glass of wine, and they sit there waiting for the fucking thing to come up, like that. And it goes up a little bit, then it falls down again. And then they pick up the voice, maybe I didn't understand it right. The whole idea is whenever I bring a roast turkey to Joe, he says, I'm not hungry. They, that's what it's about. Whatever the physical factors are, you're not that interested in it. Or else there are other factors. But you don't have to sit down and explain away your sore asshole. <laughs> So unless you visit a doctor, because I notice you walk. <laughs> yes, the piles hang out, and it's very difficult to walk any other way. And that's why I'm here. Then he says, bend over. But before he bends over, we have a habit of looking at his fingers. And proctologists have extremely <laughs> large fingers. I don't know why. <laughs> they really have thin fingers. And they really insert it in gently. It's <laughs> most, most of you girls don't know what I'm talking about. And the world you live in is made up of intellectual proctologists. And when you have a problem, they really hurt you. A lot of people don't do you any good because they really don't have answers. They really don't. And so you always come back to the source of these problems yourself. You come back to that image you have of yourself. Okay, I guess that one's it. That's about half of a lecture of one of the new classic lectures that we're putting out. They're all done. Now we're going to try and put it up on the web as an MP3. But that was just half of that one.
We haven't really put a name on it yet, well but we adjusted. will. Being well adjusted in this society. Always hard to decide on yeah. one or two words for the topic. It's always hard to decide on one or two words as a topic, as, as Joel was saying. First question, for the best that money can't buy, did you try and get it published into the mainstream? If so, what happened? Jacques wrote the book and we compiled it. Well, actually, we compiled it out of many years of Jacques a few people taking dictation from Jacques, and we compiled it together. He just addressed many different subjects, and we put it together. But he was scheduled to be on Engineering the Impossible on PBS, a PBS show in the United States, which was a big deal at the time. And so we wanted to have the book published, and we tried many different publishers, and none of them would take it. So we ended up publishing it ourselves. When Amazon first came out, we put it on Amazon, and it cost us more to print the book and to pay for the book, because we printed it ourselves, we still do, it cost us more than what Amazon gave us for it. Because by the time we had to pay shipping, we still do, and then they take a big percentage. So we were paying people to read that book for the longest time until we got pretty popular and we couldn't afford to do that anymore. So we took it off of Amazon, and now people think that the book is out of print. So I just looked the other day and some of the books are going from $65 up to over $2,000. So that's a little sidetrack, but that's what happened with the publication of that book. So we still print it ourselves, which is a big chunk every time we need to reprint it. That's why we have to sell it. How will computer systems in the Venus Project play a role in the monitoring and shaping of human behavior? First, you have to make a decision as to what behavior is useful in the new society. And once you do that, you feed that information into your computer. And you train people to be able to operate within the circumstances that you selected. In other words, you don't have anybody on an aircraft carrier that doesn't have an assigned job. Some people are pilots. Some signal the landing, some take care of the position of the aircraft, some stand there for emergency in case fire breaks out. They have firefighting apparatus. So aircraft carrier has people on it that can support the objective of the aircraft carrier. We have the same thing. In our cities of the future, we have people assigned different projects. And what they're assigned has to do with the needs of the new society. Does Steve Dahl help with your work in any way today? No, he doesn't. Steve Dahl helped edit and compile some of the dictation that Jacques did for The Best That Money Can't Buy. And then we worked with him on another book as well that we haven't published. And we're using some of that maybe for the movie. But no. He's busy with other things. How do you respond to critics who say that history is a reference that humans are greedy? Humans are inaccurate, I would say. And if they're inaccurate, they try to make their side look good. A history book will rarely point out the shortcomings, rarely, of a nation that writes its own history. It tries to make itself look good and correct in most decisions it makes, where the opposition will find the decisions inappropriate. I would say in regards to stating that people are greedy because of the references in history, all through history in the major countries, there really hasn't been a system set up which produces abundance. We've always had scarcity all through history, unless you're on some of these little islands. And when the population, like on the island that Jacques was on in Tuamoto, when the population gets larger, they make a little outrigger canoe and they put the younger people on it and they point to the sea. And sometimes they make it to another island and sometimes not, but they keep the population down so that there is abundance, there is enough to go around. So you didn't have greed, did you, on the island of Tuamoto? Would you say the people were greedy? No. They were appropriate to what existed.
Will the average person in a resource-based economy require a higher level of education than his or her counterpart in a monetary system? If they don't have the money, they can pursue that. Now you're talking about in a resource-based economy, would they have oh, a higher yes. education? Yes, you can go to school whenever you want to. Would that person living in an RBE need a higher education than somebody who is living in a society like today? That's up to each individual. You study what you're interested in. If you're not interested in anything in particular, that's your decision. Would you think there would be many people that wouldn't be interested? No, I don't think so. I think most people will be interested in serving some useful portion of their behavior to make life better for other people because other people are trying to make life better for you. I think most people would want to learn a lot more and participate in a lot more things even today, but because of the lack of money, it prohibits them from doing so. Yes, I would agree with that. Do you get donations from all over the world? Yes, we do. Now we do. And it all goes to the nonprofit. It goes towards the movie. Yeah, working up the film. Jacques, what experiments could you outline to show or demonstrate that a technology of behavior will work within the current system? Just physical evidence all around you. If a person is brought up in France, they speak French. If they're brought up in Germany, they speak German. If they're brought up in Australia, they speak like an Australian mind. That's the evidence. And you know when a person comes from the South by their regional dialect. There are people in England that can tell you exactly what part of England you're from by your regional dialect. Will you release these new 70s lectures online in MP3 format? Yes, we're going to try and do that. How much will they cost? We're trying to arrive at that now. They'll be less than the CDs. We're going to try and have them available on CD as well. When will they be ready? Well, they are ready now, but at this point, it's only Andrew who can work the website. So Andrew has become so incredibly busy that I hardly talk to him at all. So we're working desperately on a new website that Teo is doing, and it's coming along really beautifully. And when that website is up, we will have more people who will be able to help with things like that and get them done quicker. So right now, we're kind of relying on Andrew, and as soon as he has time, he will do that. But we are going to see him in another week, so hopefully he's going to be off a little bit then. For people who have read and discussed the best that money can't buy, can you give additional information on future educational methods that we can apply now. Hands-on learning. He says, just organize some trainership. Implement this method among activists, books, videos. Well, the books imply the methods to be used. When you read the best that money can buy, there's usually description in each area for furthering your knowledge in that area to write specifically what you want to know. Well, it depends on the people and their background and where they're coming from mm -hmm. and what they want to study and why. For a resource-based economy to function properly, what percentage of the population would need a college-level education or higher? A very small percentage, perhaps less than a thousand people, run everything on Earth. You don't need millions of people working anymore to sustain an efficient society. You're talking about once it's established, or are you talking about in the transition? During the transition, lots of people will be going to school, studying specific methods for attaining specific end goals. I've always heard you say in the past that you'd need about 7,000 scientists to develop things throughout the world. No, really. You don't need that many once it's underway. 
Well, that once it's underway, but in transition, maybe. I transition, don't know. you need as many teachers as you can get. When are you going to build the first city or bigger research center? How do you support it? Attract specialists, get power, food, maintenance, etc. We are stuck in this system just like everybody else. It takes money in this system to even maintain what we have. So we are always trying to make contacts in regards to the city or a bigger research center. But as of yet, we don't have the funds to do that. How long did it take to write the best that money can't buy? It wasn't something that Jack just sat down and wrote. As I mentioned, for many years, he was dictating different thoughts. And at one point, we put them together. Yes, I would say it's based on a lifetime of experience. Since the word politics can also be interpreted as tactic or method, is it correct to say that in a resource-based economy, they will also be politics, i.e. the scientific method? No, not at all. You wouldn't call the because scientific method a political system? Methods of growing plants, methods of producing transportation units, always a method directed toward a given end. How would you differentiate politics from a scientific method? Politics is based on opinions of different people. What do you think? What do you think? An advantage. Of? Yeah, and differential advantage. I don't see politics being used at all in a resource-based economy. And science is? Science is the method for accomplishing the ends. The most efficient method at the time. If someone is assigned a job in the Venus Project, do they have the option to reject? Yes, the... they do. Sure. It wouldn't be a dictatorship where you'd be making people do things. <laughs> they would have to want to participate. How much does the placebo effect have an influence in psychiatry? Well, we don't use the placebo effect. We give people the means for overcoming problems. Reason is the data that is missing in their lives to be able to handle problems. They have to be given a different set of values. You can't solve problems with the existing values that dominate the world today. Do you think there's a lot of placebo effect in the psychiatry of today, if you go to a psychiatrist? If you believe he's helping you, yes. Jacques, do you still continue learning new information? I try to keep up with whatever is new in automation and technology. I'm sorry to say I can't keep up with everything, <laughs> but I can only read the latest journals, the Scientific American magazines, books, and publications that cover other subjects. But a lot of them have opinions that are worthless or sunny day in May, if you know what that means. What is the purpose of the Venus Project, Inc., if it exists future by design nonprofit organization? First of all, when we were doing business and selling things, we were told that, and we also own this land, we were told that to protect yourself, you should become incorporated and became incorporated as the Venus Project. And then at the time when we were trying to go for a nonprofit organization, we had to first become incorporated, be a corporation, and then you apply for a nonprofit organization. I don't know if that's changed now, but we had to apply for that. We tried to fill out the application ourselves. We tried, we got rejected with the Venus Project as being a nonprofit organization. And then we tried a couple more corporations. That's why we're, we're listed now, we had, that we had several corporations. We tried several more times. We had a lawyer try it, we had an accountant try it, and we couldn't get the nonprofit for some reason, whatever was needed. We didn't know that much about it. And then we finally started a corporation, Future by Design, and we had somebody in California do the application. We were sure that this person could get it for us, and he did. We became a nonprofit organization under the name Future by Design, but you first had to become incorporated, and then you use that corporation to become a nonprofit at the time when we went for it. So that's how that all came about. 
Mr. Jacques Fresco, you're a futurist and you see or have a vision of the future. How do you explain that vision coming scientifically? You don't. You extrapolate existing conditions and existing problems. And then you sit down and you try to overcome those problems. You try to work them out so you use a minimum amount of energy and get the maximum service from it. You keep examining things and you project your values into the future. Some of them may be correct, some of them may not be correct. You'll only find out with the passing of time. Does Jacques see masturbation as an unhealthy behavior? No, it's a normal behavior. Monkeys and animals will be seen masturbating. Masturbation is normal and it tends to keep the sexual attitudes that you've learned in motion. However, the future will behave very differently. Sex will become a practicing system in the future and people won't have to masturbate as much. They will have access to the opposite sex. The opposite sex will not be trained not to have sex until they're married. They will have sex whenever they have the need for it. How can one get involved with your Venus project? I would say go to the website under Get Involved and see what we're doing and see the different groups and join the activism group if there's one in your area. If not, learn about the Venus Project and start one in your area. We would welcome that. How do you avoid jealousy in the behaviors? You don't really have to avoid it anymore. What you have to do is understand what it is that makes you feel that way, that makes you feel insecure. You've got to remember that you reject many people in your life because they don't fit your background. They don't fare with your thoughts. So you reject them and they feel jealous. But in the future, people will understand that different people coming from different backgrounds have different outlooks. And so what they feel jealous about is not what you feel jealous about. We don't eliminate jealousy. We educate people out of it. So there are more effective methods than being jealous. Jacques said that people would be assigned houses or apartment units depending on where they have been assigned a job. But he has also said that we can design our houses in the Architectural Design Center. I am confused about whether you design your own home or whether you get assigned to a house depending on where your current job is. In the future, the engineers design the house. You request the interior. You request the apparatus that you want in your house, the bookshelves, the type of books you want. All that's your decision. What goes into the house is your decision. The structural engineers work to avoid earthquakes, floods, and the house being washed away or the roof torn off by a hurricane. The engineers work out the structural problems you work out the interior. You have talked about the bubble and designing your own home and picking your home. That's the exterior of the home and the interiors are shown you. And if you pick, select a particular interior, you can modify it to meet your needs. During the transition, how TVP you be going to deal with people who can't join a new society for the reason of their beliefs or intellectual insufficiency? and how to be going to influence their behavior, birth rate, and prevent them to damage their children. And if it's possible, can Jack give some few examples of it? I believe that we'll be able to make films and we'll be able to reach different people with different backgrounds from different areas. So we select different films for them to watch. And in watching those films, we can modify that behavior modify their behavior very easily through motion pictures that have to do with matching their background and experience. What was the second part of the question, Stan? How about if they badly damage, how you can influence their birth rate, how you prevent them to damage their children? 
they usually encourage to send their children to school. And when they send their children to school, we deal with those problems there by people that are highly qualified in dealing with children from different backgrounds. You've also talked about summer camp, just like if... That's a very elaborate subject to go into now. Okay. Okay, thank you. And another one, when you talk to somebody, how do you understand when you communicate ideas? By you asking questions after you talk to them. If they come back with the right answers, they understand you. But you have to ask a lot of questions that you talk about. You ask them why. Why does the Venus Project recommend a certain direction? If they can't answer those questions, they have to go back to school. What he's talking about today, Jesse? Yes, I'm talking about the Venus Project during the transition. Thank you very much. If you want to do something today, if you want to become an aircraft pilot, you have to go to school. If you want to become a chemist, you go to a school where chemistry is taught. The same with the Venus Project. It doesn't differ. You pick the subject, you go to the school, and if you don't like it, you change your course. That's up to you. Can people learn alone, just by themselves? Yes, they can, if they wish. I would like to say something really quick. I don't believe on wars if people go on the Venus Project, because if people decide for the Venus Project, they change their mindset. So I don't believe on wars and things that most people talk on transitions. If people are aware of the Venus Project and they want to go on it, it's because they have a good idea on it. Why the hell would they do like wars and all those things? I think the wars part is just a wrong idea. Yes, I agree with that. There was a question, I think, last week or the week before about the slogan beyond politics, poverty and war. Can you just explain just very quickly what he basically meant by that or why did he choose that slogan? Because politics never came up with a solution for anything. War never settled any problems. War continues. It goes on and on. And politics is not the way to deal with problems that affect humanity. And poverty. The Venus Project would be beyond poverty. Yes, there would be no poverty. There'd be no slums. There would be no people living and substandard housing or substandard environment. I'm sorry, I have a very quick follow-up about that. When we're talking about beyond politics, poverty and war, we're talking about the general concepts, right? So, you know, if a person comes up and says, well, you know, what about the war against drugs? No, we want to pass that, right? We don't have a war against drugs because there's no need to use drugs in the future. Today, they put that term on, on a lot of things, a war against this or a war against that, and they throw a lot of money at it, but they really don't get to the root cause of it, nor do they get to the root cause of war in general. They don't touch it. If you get yes, that, remember that we stole this land from the Indians, they didn't offer it to us. We killed many Indians to get America. The same with Britain, France, Germany. All nations do the same thing. They are all basically corrupt. I would like to say something quick to Mr. Jack Fresco. If you had a donation of just like one dollar for like 10 million people, not because the Venus Project wants the money, but if each person is willing to give just like one dollar all around the world, the Venus Project would be implemented very fast because there would be uh, enough money available to start constructing many things. So people, they don't see that if they could do this because this is their life and this is what they are doing for themselves, not just for the Venus Project. People, people should see that they are working for themselves.
if they would like to do this. We have considered that, and that's a very good point. And we will emphasize that more so with the passing of time. Yeah, we, we really do need your support. It is wrong to put all that load on the backs of Roxanne and Jacques. Well, a lot it of really, people really needs the support of many people. A lot of people are supporting it, though. And that's true. If we had that many people who would support to just give a dollar, it isn't for myself and Jacques to live well somewhere. It is for all of humanity that this is, you know, it's a yeah. social project, not for certain people or no elitism whatsoever. Eventually, we need the public support. Without it, we can't do a thing. The Venus project to be implemented good and fast, it just takes like one thing. It's like people having education. And when I say education, it's not like learning math or a language. It's more people be aware of the Venus project and know as much they can about it. When people start doing that, and teaching themselves, like uh, Russia teaching the United States, the United States teaching Japan, then people will be aware of the Venus Project. And that way the Venus Project can be implemented fast. Yes, they have to know about the Venus Project. They have to know how it operates, why it's designed the way it is, why we change the language, why we use specialization, they have to understand the Venus Project before they can participate. Just like any other field, you can't become an electrical engineer unless you study the basics. And you can't become an airline pilot unless you study how to fly under different conditions. And you're right, that's what it'll take. It will take people explaining it to others. Yes. That's why we recommend that you use a book the best that money can buy. You discuss chapter one at a session, and after all the questions have been answered, you go into chapter two and chapter three, go right on through the whole book. And by the time they get through with the book, they will know enough about the Venus Project to participate. I agree with that part of the book. I would like just to say this really quick. If members of the Venus Project, people that are very aware of it, if they explain it on audio or video to other people, the Venus Project would progress a lot farther. I'm not saying that the book is not a good approach to, but I think that books for some people and people that do not speak sometimes good English or another language, they do a misinterpretation of the Venus Project. They might read it and not get what's there written. Sometimes it takes like a talking, like when Mr. Jack Fresco does it, the talkings on his home, explaining people, it's a lot different. I know, that's why I want you to use whatever methods you can yes. to get these ideas across, not just the book, pictures, drawings, conversation, whatever you have to use to get the ideas across. And then you question the person you talk to. What do you think I mean by a resource-based economy? If the answers are correct, you'll know that right away. And talking to people is a really good way of reinforcing it to yourself as well, because when people come back with different questions, you have to kind of learn how to approach them, and it's good experience. I think it's a good idea to use your own value system to change other people, but always check it out. Ask them whether they know what you mean, and if so, to describe it. There's no fixed way of doing things. Innovation. You innovate examples and give them different examples. If they don't understand it, change your approach. I know that you know this, but you have to communicate on people. Sometimes the way is not important. What is important is the communication. What do you communicate with the people you're talking to? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I guess we'll wrap it up for today. We appreciate everyone listening yes, and participating. We and we hope you continue to question it. We don't want you to follow Fresco. We want you to follow the ideas. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Jack.